In 2009, Hal Varian, Google's chief economist, said that statisticians would be the sexiest job in the coming decade. The modern big data movement really took off later in the following year after the second Hadoop world, which was hosted by Cloudera in New York City. Jeff Hammerbacher famously declared to me and John Furrier in theCUBE that the best minds of his generation were trying to figure out how to get people to click on ads. And he said, that sucks. The industry was abuzz with the realization that data was the new competitive weapon. Hadoop was heralded as the new data management paradigm. Now what actually transpired over the next 10 years was only a small handful of companies could really master the complexities of big data and attract the data science talent really necessary to realize massive returns. As well, back then cloud was in the early stages of its adoption. When you think about it at the beginning of the last decade, and as the years passed, more and more data got moved to the cloud and the number of data sources absolutely exploded. Experimentation accelerated, as did the pace of change. Complexity just overwhelmed big data infrastructures and data teams, leading to a continuous stream of incremental technical improvements designed to try and keep pace. Things like data lakes, data hubs, new open source projects, new tools, which piled on even more complexity. And as you've reported, we believe what's needed is a complete bit flip in how we approach data architectures. Our next guest is Jamak Dekhani, who is the Director of Emerging Technologies at ThoughtWorks. Jamak is a software engineer, architect, thought leader, and advisor to some of the world's most prominent enterprises. She's in my view, one of the foremost advocates for rethinking and changing the way we create and manage data architectures, favoring a decentralized over monolithic structure and elevating domain knowledge as a primary criterion in how we organize so-called big data teams and platforms. Jamak, welcome to theCUBE. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Hi, David. It's wonderful to be here. Well, okay. So you're pretty outspoken about the need for a paradigm shift in how we manage our, our data and our, and our platforms at scale. Why do you feel we need such a radical change? What's your thoughts there? Well, I think uh, if you just look back over the last decades, you gave us a, you know, a summary of what happened since 2010. But if, if, even if we go before then, uh, what we have done over the last few decades is basically repeating, and as you mentioned, incrementally improving how we've managed data based on uh, certain assumptions around, as you mentioned, centralization. Data has to be in one place so we can get value from it. But if you look at the parallel movement of our industry in general, since the birth of internet, we are actually moving towards decentralization. If we think today, like if, let's move data aside, if we said the only way web would work, the only way we get access to you know, various applications on the web or pages is to centralize it, we would laugh at that idea. But for some reason, we don't, we don't question that when it comes to data. Right. So I think it's time to embrace uh, the complexity that comes with uh, the growth of number of sources, the proliferation of sources and consumptions uh, models, uh, you know, embrace the distribution of sources of data, that they're not just within one part of organization. They're not just within even bounds of organization. They're beyond the bounds of organization. And then look back and say, OK, if that's the trend, of our industry in general, um, given the fabric of computation and data that we put in, you know, globally in place, then how the architecture and technology and organizational structure and incentives need to move to embrace that complexity. And to me, that requires a paradigm shift in full stack from how we organize our organizations, how we organize our teams, how we, uh, you know, put a technology in place. Um, to, to look at it from a decentralized angle. Okay, so let's let's unpack that a little bit. I mean, you've spoken about and written that today's big architecture, and you basically just mentioned that it's flawed. So I want to bring up, I love your diagrams. You have a simple diagram, guys, if you could bring up a figure one. So on the left here, we're ingesting data from the operational systems and other enterprise data sets. And of course, external data, we cleanse it. You know, you've got to do the, do the quality thing and then serve them up to the business. So. So what's wrong with that, that picture that we just described? And granted, it's a simplified you know, form. 
Yeah. Uh, quite a few things. So, uh, and I would flip the question maybe back to you or the audience. If we said that, you know, there are so many sources of the uh, data and that actually the data comes from systems and from teams that are very diverse in terms of uh, domains, right? A domain, if we, if we just think about, I don't know, retail, uh, the e-commerce versus order management versus customer, these are very diverse uh, domains. The data comes from many different diverse domains, and then we expect to put them under the control of a centralized team, a centralized system. And I know that centralization probably, if you zoom out, it's centralized. If you zoom in, it's it's um, compartmentalized um, based on functions, and we can talk about that. And we assume that this centralized model will be serve, you know, getting that data, making sense of it, uh, cleansing and transforming it then to satisfy a need of very diverse set of consumers without really understanding the domains because the teams responsible for it are not close to the source of the data. So there is a bit of a um, cognitive gap and domain understanding gap, um, you know, without really understanding either how the data is going to be used. I, I've talked to numerous, when we came with this, I came up with the idea, I talked to a lot of data teams globally just to see you know, what are the pain points? How are we, they doing it? And one thing that was evident in all of those conversations that they actually didn't know after they built these pipelines and put the data in, whether the data were house tables or lake, they didn't know how the data was being used, but yet they're responsible for making the data available for this diverse set of use cases. So um, a centralized system, a monolithic system often is a bottleneck. So what you find is that a lot of the teams are struggling with satisfying the needs of the consumers, they're struggling with really understanding the data, the domain knowledge is lost, there is a um, loss of understanding and um, kind of the, in, that, in that transformation often, you know, we end up training machine learning models on data that is not really representative of the reality of the business and then we put them to production and they don't work because uh, the, the, the semantic and the syntax of the data gets lost within that translation. So, um, and we are struggling with finding people to, uh, you know, to manage a centralized system because the, still the technology is fairly, in my opinion, fairly low level and exposes the users of those technology sets, they, like say warehouse, a lot of, um, you know, complexity. So in summary, I think, um, it's a bottleneck. It's not going to, um, you know, satisfy the pace of change and pace of innovation and the pace of, you know, availability of the sources. Um, it's disconnected and fragmented, even though it's centralized, it's disconnected and fragmented from where the data comes from and where the data gets used. Uh, and it's managed by, you know, a, a, a team of hyper-specialized people that, um, you know, that they're, they're struggling to understand the actual value of the data, the actual format of the data. So, uh, it's not going to get us where our aspirations or ambitions need to be. Yeah, so the big data platform is essentially, uh, I think you call it uh, uh, context agnostic. And, and so as data becomes you know, more important in our lives, you've got all these new data sources you know, injected into the system. Experimentation, as we said, with the cloud becomes much, much easier. So one of the blockers that you've cited, and you just mentioned it, is you've got these hyper-specialized roles, the data engineer, the quality engineer, data scientist, and, and the, it's illusory. I mean, it's like an illusion. These guys are, they seemingly, they're independent and, and can scale independently, but, but I think you've made the point that in fact, uh, they, they can't, that a change in a data source has an effect across the entire data lifecycle, entire data pipeline. So maybe you could, maybe you could add some, some color to why that's problematic for some of the organizations that you work with and maybe give some examples. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in fact, the, the initially the hypothesis around data mesh came from a series of requests that we received from our both large scale and progressive clients and uh, progressive in terms of their investment in data architecture. So these were clients that they, they were uh, they were large at scale. They had diverse and rich set of domains. Some of them were big technology um, tech companies. Some of them were big retail companies, 
big healthcare companies. So they had that diversity of the data and the number of the, you know, the sources of the domains. They had invested for quite a few years in um, you know, generations of, they had multi-generations of proprietary data warehouses on-prem that they were moving to cloud. They had moved to the various you know, revisions of the Hadoop clusters and they were moving to that to cloud. And they, the challenges that they were facing were simply, they were not, like if I want to just like, um, you know, simplify it in one phrase, they were not getting value from the data that they were collecting. They were continuously struggling to uh, shift the culture because there was so much friction between all of these three phases of both consumption of the data, then transformation and making it available, uh, consumption from sources and then providing it and serving it to the consumer. So that whole process was full of friction. Everybody was unhappy. So it's bottom line is that you're collecting all this data, there is delay, there is um, lack of trust in the data itself because the data is not representative of the reality. It's gone through transformation, but people that didn't understand really what the data was got delayed. Uh, and so there's no trust. It's hard to get to the data. It's hard to create, ultimately it's hard to create value from the data and people are working really hard and under a lot of pressure, but it's still you know, struggling. So we often, you know, our solutions, like we are, you know, technologists, we often point at the technology. So we go, okay, this this version of, you know, some some proprietary data warehouse we're using is not the right thing. We should go to the cloud, and that certainly will solve our problem, right? Or warehouse wasn't a good one. Let's make a lake version. So instead of you know uh, extracting and then transforming and loading into the database, and that transformation is a you know heavy process because you fundamentally made an assumption using warehouse is that if I transform this data into this multi-dimensional, uh, perfectly designed schema that then everybody can run whatever query they want, that's gonna solve you know, everybody's problem. But in reality, it doesn't because you, you are delayed and there is no universal model that serves everybody's need. Everybody needs a diverse data. Scientists necessarily don't, don't like the perfectly modeled uh, data. They're looking for both signals and the noise. So then, you know, we've, we've just gone from uh, ETLs to, let's say now, to Lake, which is, okay, let's move the transformation to the, to the last mile. Let's just get load, load the data into, um, into the um, object stores and into semi-structured files and get the data scientists use it. But they're still struggling because of uh, the, the problems that we mentioned. Um, so then with the solution, what is the solution? Well, next generation data platform, let's put it on the cloud. And we saw clients that actually had gone through, you know, a year or multiple years of migration to the cloud, but with, it was great. 18 months, I've seen, you know, nine months migrations of the warehouse versus two year migrations of the uh, various data sources to the clouds. But ultimately the result is the same. Unsatisfied, frustrated data users, data providers, um, you know, with lack of ability to innovate quickly on relevant data and have, a, have, have an experience that they deserve to have, have a delightful experience of uh, discovering and exploring data that they trust. And all of that was still a miss. So something, something else more fundamentally needed to change than just the technology. So the, and the, the linchpin to your scenario is this notion of context. And you, you pointed out, you made the other observation that look, we've made our operational systems context aware, but our data platforms are, are not. Um, and, and like CRM system, sales guys are very comfortable with what's in the CRM system. They own the data. So let's talk about the answer that you and your, your colleagues are proposing. You're essentially flipping the architecture whereby those domain knowledge workers, the builders, if you will, of, of data products or data services, they're now first class citizens in the data flow and they're injecting by design domain knowledge in, into the system. So, so I want to put up another one of your charts. Guys, bring up the figure two there. Um, it talks about you know, convergence. You show data, distributed domain-driven architecture, this self-serve platform design, and, and this notion of product thinking. So maybe you could explain why this approach is, is so desirable in your view. Sure. Um, the motivation and inspirations for the approach came from um, studying what has happened over the last few decades in operational systems. We had a very similar problem 
uh, prior to microservices with monolithic systems. Monolithic systems were, you know, the, the bottleneck, um, they, the changes we needed to make was always, you know, orthogonal to how the or architecture was centralized. And we found a nice niche. And I'm not saying this is the perfect way of um, decoupling a monolith, but it's a way that currently where we are in our journey to become data driven um, it is, a, is a nice place to be, um, which is distribution or a decomposition of your system as well as organization. I think when we, whenever we talk about systems, we've got to talk about people and teams that are responsible for managing those systems. So the decomposition of the, the systems and the teams and the data around domains, because that's how today we are um, decoupling our business, right? We're decoupling our businesses around domains, and that's a that's a good thing. And that what 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 does that do really for us? What it does is it localizes change to the bounded context of that business. It creates clear boundary and interfaces and contracts between the rest of the universe of the organization and that particular team. So removes the friction uh, that often we have for both managing the change and both serving uh, data or capabilities. So it, the first principle of data mesh is let's decouple this world of analytical data the same to mirror uh, the same way we have decoupled our systems and teams and business. Why data is any different? And the moment you do that, so you, the moment you bring the ownership to people who understands the data best, uh, then you get questioned that, well, how is that any different from silos of disconnected databases that we have today and nobody can get to the data? So then the rest of the principles is really to address all of the challenges that comes with this first uh, principle of decomposition around domain context. Uh, and the second principle is, well, uh, we have to expect a certain level of quality and accountability and responsibility for the teams that provide the data. So let's bring product thinking and treating data as a product to the data that these teams now um, share. And let's put accountability around it. We need a new set of incentives and metrics for domain teams to share the data. We need to have a new set of um, kind of quality metrics that define what it means for the data to be a product. And we can go through that conversation perhaps later. Um, so then the second principle is, okay, the, the, the teams now that are responsible, the domain teams responsible for their analytical data need to provide that data with a certain level of quality and assurance. Uh, let's call that a product and bring product thinking to that. And then the next question you get asked often by CIOs or CTOs, the people who build the infrastructure and you know spend the money, they say, well, it's actually quite complex to manage big data. And now we're, we want everybody, every independent team to manage the full stack of, you know, storage and computation and pipelines and, you know, access control and all of that. And that's, uh, well, we've solved that problem in operational world. And that requires really a new uh, level of platform thinking uh, to provide infrastructure and tooling to the domain teams to now be able to manage and serve their big data. And that, I think that, requires reimagining the world of um, our tooling and technology. But uh, for now, let's just assume that we need a new level of abstraction to hide away a ton of complexity that unnecessarily people get um, exposed to. And that, that's the third principle of creating self self infrastructure um, to allow autonomous teams to build their domains. But then the last pillar, the last you know, fundamental pillar is, okay, once you distribute a problem into smaller problems, then you found yourself with another set of problems, which is how I'm going to connect this data, how I'm going to, you know, the, the insights happens and emerges from the interconnection of the data domains, right? It's just not necessarily locked into one domain. So the concerns around interoperability and standardization and getting value as a result of composition and interconnection of these uh, domains uh, requires a new approach to governance. And um, we have to think about governance very differently um, based on a federated model and based on a computational model. Like once we have this powerful self-serve platform, we can computationally automate a lot of governance decisions um, that, and, and security decisions and policy decisions that applies to a, you know, a, a, this fabric of mesh uh, not just a single uh, domain or not in a centralized mode. So uh, really, as you mentioned, the, the, the most uh, important component of the, the data mesh is distribution of ownership and distribution of architecture and data. The rest of them is to solve all the problems that come with that. 
So very powerful, uh, guys, we actually have a picture of what Jamak just described. Bring up, bring up figure three, if you would. So I mean, essentially you're advocating for the pushing of the, the pipeline and all its various functions into the lines of business and abstracting that complexity of the underlying infrastructure, which you kind of show here in this figure, data infrastructure is a platform down below. And it, you know what I love about this, Jamak, is it, it to me, it underscores the data is not the new oil. Cause I can put oil in my car, I can put it in my house, but I can't put the same quart in both places. But you, I think you call it polyglot data, which is really different forms, batch or whatever. But, but, but the da same data, data doesn't uh, follow the laws of scarcity. I can use the same data for many, many uses. And that's what this sort of graphic shows. And then you brought in the really important, you know, sticking problem, which is that, you know, the governance, which is now not a command and control it's, it's federated governance. So maybe you could add some thoughts on that. Sure, absolutely. It's one of those, I think um, I, I keep referring to data mesh as a paradigm shift and it's not just to make it sound ground and you know, like kind of grand and exciting or important. It's really because I want to point out, we need to question every moment when we make a decision around how we're going to design security or governance or modeling of the data, we need to reflect and go back and say, am I applying some of my cognitive biases around how I have worked for the last 40 years or have seen it work? Or do I, do I really need to question? And we do need to question um, the way we have applied governance. I think at the end of the day, the role of the data governance and the objective remains the same. I mean, we all want quality data accessible to a diverse set of users. And these users now you know, have different personas, like data persona of data analysts, data scientists, data application um, you know, user. These are very diverse personas. So at the end of the day, we want quality data accessible to them, um, trustworthy in, in an easy, consumable way. Um, However, how we get there looks very different in, as you mentioned, that the governance model in the old world has been very command and control, very centralized. Um, you know, they, they were responsible for quality, they were responsible for uh, certification of the data, um, you know, applying, making sure the data complies with all sorts of regulations, um, make sure, you know, data gets discovered and, and uh, made available. In the, the world of the data mesh, really the job of the data governance governance as a function becomes finding the equilibrium between uh, what decisions need to be um, uh, you know, made and enforced globally and what decisions need to be made locally so that we can have an interoperable mesh of data sets uh, that can move fast and can change fast. Like it's really about um, instead of Harness, you know, kind of putting the putting the systems in a straight jacket of being constant and don't change. Embrace change and continuous change of landscape because that's that's just the reality we can't escape. So the role of governance, really, the, the governance model I call um, federated and computational, and by that I mean um, every domain needs to have a representative in the governance team. So uh, the role of the data or domain data product owner, who really where understands the data of that domain really well, but also wears the hats of a product owner, uh, is is an important role that ha has to have a representative in the governance team. So it's a federation of domains coming together, um, plus the SMEs and people have, you know, subject matter experts who understand the regulations in that environment, who understands the data security concerns. But instead of trying to enforce and do this as a central team, they make decisions as what need to be standardized, what need to be enforced. And let's push that into that computationally and in an automated fashion into the, uh, into the um, platform itself, for example. Instead of um, um, trying to um, do the, you know, be part of the data quality pipeline and inject ourselves as people in, in that process, let's actually as a group define what constitutes quality. Like, how do we measure quality? And then let's automate that and let's um, codify that into the platform so that every data product will have a CI CD pipeline. And as part of that pipeline, those quality metrics get validated. And every data product needs to publish those SLOs or you know, service level objectives or you know, whatever that we choose as a measure of quality. Uh, maybe it's the 
you know, the integrity of the data, the delay in the data, the time, liveliness of it, whatever are the decisions that you're making, let's codify that. So it's, um, it's really um, the, the role of the governance, the, the objectives of the governance team try to satisfy is the same, but how they do it, it's, it's very, very different. I wrote a new article recently um, trying to explain the logical um, architecture that would emerge from applying these principles. And I put a kind of a light table to compare and contrast the role of the you know, how we do governance today versus how we would do it differently to just give people a, a flavor of what does it mean to embrace decentralization and what does it mean to embrace change and continuous change. Um, so hopefully that 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 could be help, um, helpful. Yes, very, so, so many questions I have. And, but but the, the point you make it too is on data quality, sometimes I feel like quality is the end game, whereas the end game should be how fast you can go from idea to monetization with a data service. What happens again, you sort of addressed this, but what happens to the underlying infrastructure? I mean, spinning up EC2s and S3 buckets and my Pi torches and TensorFlows. And wh where does that, that lives in the business and, and who's responsible for that? Yeah, that's, I'm glad you're asking this question, David, because um, I truly believe we need to reimagine that world. Um, I think there are many pieces that we can use um, as utilities and foundational pieces, but I, but I, uh, I can see uh, for myself a five to seven year roadmap of building this new tooling. I think in terms of the ownership, the question around ownership, that would remain with a platform team, but, uh, a dom perhaps a domain agnostic technology focused team, right? That there are providing a set of products themselves, and uh, but the products are the, the users of those products are data product developers, right? Data domain teams that now uh, have really high expectations in terms of low friction, in terms of uh, lead time to create a new data product. Um, so we need a new set of tooling and I, I I think the language needs to shift from, you know, I need a storage bucket or I need a storage account or I need a cluster to run my, you know, Spark uh, jobs to Here's the declaration of my data product. This is where the data for it will come from. This is the data that I want to serve. These are the policies that I need to uh, apply in terms of perhaps encryption or access control. Um, go make it happen platform. Go provision everything that I need so that as a data product developer, all I can focus on is the data itself. Representation of semantic and representation of the syntax and make sure that data meets the quality that I have um, that I have to assure and it's available. The rest of provisioning of everything that sits underneath will have to get taken care of by the platform. And that's what I mean by um, requires a reimagination. And, and in fact, um, and, and there will be a data platform team. The data platform teams that we set up for our clients, in fact, themselves have a fair bit of complexity internally. They, they divide into multiple teams. Uh, multiple planes, uh, so there would be a plane as in a group of capabilities that satisfy that data product developer experience. There would be a set of capabilities that deal with those nitty gritty underlying utilities. I call them at this point utilities because to me that the, the, the level of abstraction of the platform needs to go higher than where it is. So what we call platform today are a set of utilities we'll be continuing to using. We'll be continuing to using object storage. We'll continue using um, relational databases and so on. So there would be a plane and a group of people responsible for that. Uh, there would be a group of people responsible for capabilities that um, uh, you know enable the mesh level um, um, functionality, for example, be able to correlate and connect and query data from uh, multiple nodes as a mesh level capability, be able to discover and explore the mesh data products as a mesh level capability. So it would be set of teams as part of platforms with a strong, again, platform product thinking embedded and product ownership embedded into that to satisfy the experience of this now business oriented uh, domain data teams. Uh, so there's a, we have a lot of work to do. I could go on, I, unfortunately we're out of time, but, but I guess my, my, first of all, I want to tell people there's two pieces that you've put out so far. One is, um, how to move beyond a monolithic data lake to a distributed data mesh. You guys should read that. And then data mesh principles and logical architecture is kind of part two. I guess my last question in the very limited time we have is, are organizations ready for this? We, I, I think uh, the desire is there. I've been um, overwhelmed with the number of 
large and medium and small and private and public <laughs> and governments and federal, you know, organizations that reach out to us globally. I mean, it's not a, this is this is a global movement, and I'm humbled by the response of the industry. I think there is, the desire is there. The pains are real. People acknowledge that um, something needs to change here. Uh, so that's the first step. I think that awareness um, is spreading. Uh, organizations are more and more becoming aware. In fact, uh, many technology providers are reaching out to us asking, uh, what, you know, what shall we do? Because our clients are asking us, you know, people are already asking, we need a data machine, we need the tooling to support it. Uh, so the awareness is there in terms of the first step of being ready. However, uh, the ingredients of a successful transformation requires top-down and bottom-up support. So it requires, you know, support from chief data analytics officers um, or above the most successful clients that we have with data mesh are the ones that, you know, the, the CEOs have made a statement that, you know, we want to change the experience of every single customer using data and we're going to do, we're going to commit to this. So the investment and support, you know, exists from top to all layers, the engineers are excited that maybe perhaps the traditional uh, data teams are open to change. So there are a lot of ingredients of transformation needs to come together. Um, are we really ready for it? I think uh, I think the pioneers, perhaps the innovators, if you think about that innovation, uh, careful adopters, probably pioneers and innovators and lead adopters are um, making making move towards it, and hopefully as the technology becomes more available, organizations that are less or you know engineering oriented, they don't have the capability in-house today, but they can buy it, uh, they would come next. Maybe those are not the ones who are quite ready for it because the technology is not readily available and requires you know internal investment today. I think you're right on. I think the leaders are going to lean in hard and they're going to show us the path over the next several years. And, and I think the, the end of this decade is going to be defined a lot differently than the beginning. Jamak, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and participating in the program. Thank you for hosting me, David. Pleasure it's having been you. wonderful. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We're back right after this short break. <laughs>